happened here. Uh, for example, there was a body of water uh, and sediment slowly trickled out of that body of water and it formed maybe this layer of rock. And then that layer of rock solidified and another uh, trickle of sediment occurred to form this next layer of rock. And that's how those layers of rock form. They all form subsequently over a million years of slow sediment accumulation. That's the standard story. However, we see that this formed in just five hours. Okay? So, obviously, geology isn't as simple as some people like, like you to believe. Stratified sedimentary rock under the right conditions in natural settings can form very rapidly. Here's an overhead shot of a couple of canyons. All right? Uh, you can see that, uh, uh, you can kind of see right up there, there's some water. There's a river running through that canyon on the right. There's a smaller river running through the canyon on the left. This canyon here is called Engineer's Canyon. Uh, it's been in the uh, state of Washington for a long time. Um, the canyon on the left, however, is fairly new. And it formed in a day. It formed in a day, once again, as a result of the uh, water that flowed from the natural dam break that occurred during the uh, eruption of Mount St. Helens. So that canyon formed in just a day. Now I want to show you a, a view of it shooting down. So I'm, this is an overhead view. Now I'm going to shoot through the canyon. So this is the canyon that's formed. Now please understand what's happened here. This rock has been there, right? This rock was there before the, uh, 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 the uh, uh, eruption, right? What happened is the eruption broke a dam, a lot of water started flowing, that water came through and eroded most of that rock away to form this canyon. And once again, there's our first year graduate student. You might not be able to see him because he's a little small. There's our first year graduate student <laughs> providing a scale to show you how big this canyon is. Now once again, if we didn't know this was as a result of the uh, uh, eruption of Mount St. Helens, we would conclusively say that what happened was this river was flowing through the canyon. Over millions and millions of years, slowly eroded the rock away. The, originally all the rock was level, but this river slowly eroded things away until it formed this canyon. And that, of course, took millions of years. However, that's not what we see. We see these hap this, this happened in less than a day. So once again, it's not clear that geology is as simple as some people would like you to believe. But nevertheless, you don't see this side of geology very much. I don't think if you take a geology course, you're going to find this data in your geology textbook. I really don't. And then, of course, evolutionists don't uh, reserve their lives for data only. They also uh, reserve it for mathematics. Uh, this is Stephen Gould and, four, and, and a few other authors in a book called A View of Life. Here's his statement. Is life a product of chance, some fundamentally lucky event that happened only because so much time was available? Given enough time, you'll eventually flip 100 heads in a row, however improbably it might be in one trial. Sounds reasonable, doesn't it? Given enough time, you'll eventually flip 100 heads in a row, however improbably it might be in one trial. Well, actually, we can calculate the percentage chance of that happening. Um, if we flip a coin, it's 50% chance it's heads, 50% chance it's tails. If we flip a coin twice, the chance of getting two heads or two tails in a row is 50% times 50% or 25%. You do that 100 times, your chance of getting 100 heads in a row, 1 in 10 to the 30. That's a 1 followed by 30 zeros. If you flipped a coin once each second, 24 hours a day, it would take 40 billion times the accepted age of the universe to get the result Stephen Gould's talking about. Now, Stephen Gould's a smart guy. And he obviously knows statistics. And he probably knows how false that statement is. Why would he say it? If it's really, <laughs> this kind of probability just doesn't happen. Why then would he say something like that? He'd say it because he's got to get the reader to believe that improbable things happen all the time. Because that's the way you get people to believe in evolution. Every step of evolution is an incredibly improbable event. And you've got to have billions of these steps. So, you get them to believe that improbable things happen every time by throwing in little asides like this. Patently false, but nevertheless, it makes the student more likely to believe that something improbable can happen. And then probably the thing that bothers me the most, and we saw a little bit about it in the question and answer session in the previous uh, uh, discussion, is that evolutionists simply want to squelch competing ideas. Rather than discussing these things, they simply squ squelch them. For example, uh, uh, a, a school board in Louisiana 
at one time required teachers to read a statement before uh, discussing evolution. And the statement said something, here was part of the statement. The student was to, quote, exercise critical thinking, gather all information possible, and closely examine each alternative towards forming an opinion regarding the origin of life and matter. Doesn't that sound kind of reasonable? Shouldn't I be telling students to think critically, gather all information possible? Well, no. Federal courts, at the urging of evolutionists, made this statement illegal. It is, in fact, illegal now for a teacher to tell students to exercise critical thinking, to gather all information, and closely examine each alternative. That is now illegal in the state of Louisiana. Because in the end, if they did that, they might find out something uh, about evolution that the evolutionists don't want them to find out. High school teacher Rodney uh, Levesque was demoted and reassigned because he discussed data that contradicts evolution in class. He didn't talk about competing theories. He simply said, here's the theory of evolution. We don't understand these data in light of that theory. For that, he was just demoted. Professor of biology at San Francisco State University was forbidden to teach the introductory biology course he had been teaching for years because he started distressing design elements that he found in nature. Um, well, the biology department felt that would confuse students when they re later reached the course on evolution because, you know, evolution doesn't design things, they just ha happen by chance. So in the end, he was forbidden to teach that course. Kevin Haley, I get a PhD from biology from Purdue University, had been teaching science at Central Oregon Community College since 1996. He was called an excellent teacher. His student evaluations were superb. Um, he was fired because he refused to stay in class that evolution is a fact. And for that he was fired. Baylor University holds the Michael Polanyi Center. Its job is to do research in the conceptual nature of science. Well, how is it that science works? What do we really learn from science? The center tried to sponsor an international conference that included two Nobel laureates. The faculty senate voted to shut it down because one of the speakers was William, because, uh, sorry, because William Dembski, the center's director, is one of the founders of the intelligent design movement of bi biology. And the intelligent design movement of biology, they're saying, if you look at nature, it's clear that it's been designed and we ought to be asking questions about the designer. The center isn't closed, but the faculty still wants it closed. Why? Because it raises the specter that there may be something wrong with evolution and we just can't have that. Forrest Mims had written some freelance articles for Scientific Americans. Um, when he applied for a full-time position, he was not hired because he's a creationist. Scientific American nevertheless admitted that his work is fabulous, great, first wave, and should be published somewhere. <laughs> but shouldn't be published in Scientific American because he's a creationist. This is a real problem. If you, as I said in the first hour, if you want to learn scientifically, the way you do it is through debate. You get two people who hold views, look at the data, and debate the data. Unfortunately, in certain areas of science today, this is considered not good. And that's holding back science, I really do think it is. Uh, and so in the end, that's why I consider evolution the enemy of truth and science. Okay, we've got time for more questions. So, yes sir? Yeah, I've got a question about the protein yes. Right. So that the DNA gives instructions which creates that sequence of proof uh, or amino acids. Right. So essentially it's a paragraph or a sentence if you will find It's a recipe, yeah. Okay. So if you write a sentence, you write a paragraph, and you change one word in that, okay, you change the meaning of the sentence. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Okay, that's a really good question. And for those of you who didn't hear, uh, if we look at this as more of a paragraph of, 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 of words, uh, I can change one word, uh, the, to an A, and that doesn't change the information in the uh, paragraph very much. I could change another word, uh, man to woman, and that could change the information in the paragraph significantly, right? And the question is, if we're just looking at global change, like I was looking at here, um, 
all, I'm looking at all changes, be they both significant and insignificant. And the question is, well, I should probably try and focus on significant.